Thank you, Ian. Well, let me add my welcome uh, to Sam's. Uh, welcome to Cross Culture tonight. My name is Weihan, and I've been speaking uh, since last Sunday from uh, this letter of Paul to Timothy to Timothy. If you've got your Bible or your electronic device, please keep it open to 2 Timothy and chapter 4. We come now at last to uh, the final section of this letter. Uh, as we come to God's Word, how about I pray again? Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word to us. Please help us now to listen to what your Spirit is saying to each of us. Please change us by the power of your Spirit that we might be increasingly useful to you, encouraged by you for the work of mission that you've called your church to do. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, welcome to this final session of uh, Cross Culture's 45th Global Annual Global Missions Convention. It's been a real pleasure and privilege to be here with you uh, studying this letter. And thank you especially if you've stayed the course uh, for each and every one of the uh, talks from 2 Timothy. Uh, my prayer really is that our hearts will be stirred by what we learn of Paul's last words to Timothy and God's words to us today. Well, uh, I have some slides that will come up then. Uh, the outline for this talk is also in the Missions Convention booklet if you've got one in front of you. Otherwise, please follow on along in the slides. Uh, the first section is entitled Tricky Bible Names and Why You Should Love Them. Tricky Bible Names and Why You Should Love Them. Uh, the Bible is filled with tricky Bible names, isn't it? It's a braved, rostered-on Bible reader who takes on the lists of names for uh, numbers when you, this church decides to do that preaching series. And that's why it always pays if you're rostered on as the Bible reader, uh, as I'm sure Ian, you did tonight, to read the assigned passage in advance. And if there are tricky names, uh, rehearse them because you don't want to turn up to be the Bible reader with the Bible on your phone and then see that tricky name looming up towards you at the end of the sentence and you have no idea what's going to come out of your mouth. Well, names are super significant, aren't they? Uh, every culture of the world that I've come across, uh, in every culture, names are meaningful. Uh, parents and families and societies, they invest so much in the meaning and significance of names. You know, I bet that every single one of us in this chapel tonight, at some stage in our lives, we've looked up the meaning of our own names, or at least we've had someone in the family tell us what the meaning of our name is. And something within us wants to know what our name actually means. And when we find out that that meaning can have some kind of strange power and influence over how we see ourselves and our destiny. Uh, so in my case, Wei Han Kwan, which when translated literally means high-ranking government civil servant <laughs> uh, and great scholar. So it turns out that for a while I worked for the Australian Taxation Office, and I've done my fair share of nerdy, high-level academic research. So, you see, names mean something. Think how different my life would be if I was Honest John Shorty Carpenter or something like that. <laughs> of course, names aren't completely determinative. Naming your son Augustus Caesar or Alexander the Great is no guarantee that that boy will grow up to conquer, empire, conquer and build empires. And naming your child River or Sky or Phoenix, you know, it doesn't magically transform them into something ethereal or one with nature. It just means you're hippie and your child will be teased mercifully at school. <laughs> Sorry if your name is River, Sky or Phoenix. <laughs> Counseling's available at this church afterwards. <laughs> See, the real point I'm trying to make is names come with people. And with people come their stories, their life stories, their real lives. And in the Bible, please notice, the inscripturated stories of their lives. That is, life stories that, for whatever reason, God has chosen to fix forever in His eternal Word. He's inscripturated those names, those lives, those stories. And He's done that because, as we learned this morning, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful 
for training us, encouraging us, even rebuking us, so that we might be fully equipped for every good work. Now, this means that as we come to know and love God's Word, we ought to come and love tricky Bible names. We ought to come to love the stories behind the real people whose names these are. They are part of God's Word. They're useful for building us up, for equipping us for every good work. They teach us, they warn us, they rebuke us, they encourage us. Their stories are part of God's story. So to these names, we turn in this last section of 2 Timothy The first name is Demas, Demas. Now, not all the names in the Bible are good and heroic. We've already seen in the course of this this week some names to definitely not reserve for your baby boys. Do you remember them? Phygelus and Hermogenes, Philetus and Hymenaeus. Now you can add Demas to that list. Paul writes to Timothy, verse 9, Do your best to come to me soon. Why? For Demas in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas, who started with Paul and the missionary team, is now, we read, in love with this present world. That is, he's no longer in love with the Lord Jesus and the mighty future promises of the gospel of Christ. He has deserted Paul and he's nicked off to Thessalonica. Uh, Perhaps that's where he was from originally, so he's just gone home. Or perhaps that's where he's gone to chase the love of his life, you know, his love of this present world. We're we're simply not told. But what we do know is that Demas was once part of the team. He's mentioned in Philemon and in Colossians and identified there with Luke as a member of Paul's crack missionary team, but no longer. Friends, don't be a Demas. Do you know a Demas or two? Sadly, I know more than a handful. People who started with Christ and who seemed so enthusiastic, so on fire for the gospel of Christ in the beginning, and then gradually or suddenly things changed. And often, so often, uh, for younger people who then grow up, it has to do with falling in love with this present world, typically falling in love with a non-Christian person or a person who's within the church, but just not on, as on fire for the gospel and gospel ministry or missionary work as they are. Uh, for people who aren't Christian, sometimes it's, uh, we're just friends, or I'm spending a lot of time with this person because I'm talking to him or her about Jesus, uh, what we in the pastoral industry sometimes call flirt to convert flirt to convert. It doesn't work. Don't do it. What typically typically happens is that the devil uses that earthly attraction to draw the believer away from Christ rather than to draw the unbeliever to Christ. Don't do it. Don't fall in love with this present world. Well, I think of another person uh, from my own history. Once a strong and key leader in the university student group up in Melbourne University and in the local church, But later, in love with the world, you know, got a really high-paying job and started to enjoy the things and the experiences that money can buy, overseas travel, fine, fine food, nice toys, gradually falling away from Christ, losing passion for the gospel in love with this world. But for Demas, maybe it was just the sheer difficulty, the cost of discipleship, the persecution and suffering that came with being part of Paul's missionary team. Maybe that did it. Maybe he just had had enough and he was retreating in love with comfort and security, just wanting a little bit more peace and happiness instead of the constant challenge of missionary life. Maybe he had failed to see how his first love for Christ ought to have been sustaining him and filling him with joy and power, no matter what his circumstances. Some of that we heard in that last missionary video. He was in love instead, perhaps, with the comforts and joys of this world. Don't do it. Don't be a Demas. Remember that Bible name. Next, we have a group of names. These are the good guys. Crescens, Titus, Tychicus, Luke, Mark, Carpus. 
We read, Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I've, left, I've sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. More names, and, and these are all the good guys. Uh, Crescens and Titus and Tychicus have been dispatched to the churches in Galatia and Dalmatia and Ephesus. Uh, Galatia, of course, we read about uh, in the letter to the Galatians. Ephesus, we read about in the letter uh, to the Ephesians. Uh, Dalmatia is the region just north of Macedonia. They don't have a Bible letter. They just have very strange spotty dogs. That's okay. Uh, Luke is left as Paul's only companion in Rome. And there's reasonable evidence that he served as Paul's uh, amanuensis or scribe, helping Paul to write his letters. And also then with Paul, uh, writing his own gospel, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts eventually. And he was no doubt collecting the material and editing it and collating it along the way. Now the mention of Mark in verse 11 is especially noteworthy. For if we cast our minds back to the end of Acts 15. Actually, turn, turn to Acts 15 if you've got a Bible on you. Just turn to the end of Acts 15 now. We remember at the end of Acts 15 uh, that at that point in the missionary journeys, Paul was wanting to set off on another journey to strengthen and encourage the churches. But Acts 15 uh, verse 37, we read, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so sharp that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. In other words, in Acts 15, Paul thought that Mark was a bit of a loser, he had earlier chickened out of the work in Pamphylia. Perhaps Mark was a bit like a, a B-team player, and Paul, well, he only wanted A-team players on his team. Uh, please notice, there isn't any issue of being like Demas here in Acts 15. Mark hasn't abandoned the faith. He's still faithful to the Lord Jesus. But it's just that Paul didn't think that he, he, he made the grade. You know, he didn't cut it to be a member of Paul's missionary team. However, we read Barnabas, the encourager, thinks that Mark is still worth investing in. So on one hand, you've got Paul, who's your kind of high standards, meet the grade, or get out kind of A-team coach. And then you've got Barney over here, who's your loving, encouraging, okay, let's love you and build you up, pastor type. And you've got a sharp disagreement between these two leaders. There it is in verse 39. Biblical warrant for Christian leaders to disagree on matters of team recruitment and human resource deployment. Well, that was the last time we saw Mark. Now come back with me to uh, 2 Timothy. And now in 2 Timothy, it's some years later, and what do we read? We read Mr. A. Team Paul saying, make sure whatever you do, don't forget to bring Mark. Bring him also. He is useful. See, Mark's gone from that loser that Paul wouldn't have on his team to this useful dude whom Timothy mustn't forget to bring along. What a turnaround and what, what an endorsement of Barnabas' ministry of encouragement and training and equipping this one-time B-team player. So what do we learn from Mark's story? I think we learn uh, two important things. First, sometimes you need to run with the A-team. See, for lots of reasons, uh, in my work at CMS, the Church Missionary Society, I say no to applicants all the time. I say things like, I love your enthusiasm, your passion to go, but really I think you need to grow up a little, or I think you need more cross-cultural experience, or I think you need to go to Bible college first. You need X, Y, or Z before you can come back and talk to me about being a missionary. Uh, in fact, just uh, last, last year, late last year, when we were interviewing applicants, we asked one applicant, why, why have you chosen to go with CMS? And without skipping a beat, she said, because you say no. <laughs> because you say no. 
Uh, and I want to know if you don't think I'm ready. Uh, that was a great commendation of a maturity. So the first thing we learn is that sometimes you need to run with the A-team. Second thing we learn from Mark's story is never underestimate the power of encouragement. Now, that's Barnabas down to a T, isn't it? Barney, whom you remember, took Saul, the early convert, in Acts 9 and encouraged him and mentored him and helped him to become, under God, Paul, the apostle and missionary. Uh, the same Barnabas who encouraged Mark. So we are to be careful to exercise this same ministry of encouragement. You know, gospel leaders, uh, future church pastors, youth ministers and missionaries, they don't just grow on trees. They're not just sent down from heaven by God, uh, although the worst of them probably think they are. No, gospel leaders and missionaries have typically been carefully mentored and trained and equipped and encouraged along the way by a succession of Barnabases. You know, I know that's my story. Uh, over 30 years, I can ad- identify so many men and women who've helped me along the way. You might be here today needing some training and equipping and mentoring. Well, you can take up some opportunities. They're right there on the response card. You can join a mission nurture group. You can go on a perspective course. And, or you might be here saying, I've never really been mentored into ministry. Well, you can tick that first box uh, and someone can make an appointment with you to talk with you about these things. You might be here as a leader tonight. Well, the challenge of Mark's story is this. Who are you encouraging this year, this season of ministry? Who are you seeking to raise up into more gospel and missionary leadership? Well, we keep working on the list. Uh, Carpus is next. Carpus is the cloakman in Troas. Uh, he evidently has a house and uh, lots of space to store stuff like clothing and books. And he sounds like a great friend to missionaries. Uh, missionaries usually need to store stuff while they go away, you know, like the winter clothes they're never going to need in tropical Africa. Uh, please notice how keen Paul is uh, in verse 13 to get his books and his parchments back. Uh, there's a hint there that you never stop studying, you never stop reading uh, and writing as a Christian leader. Uh, Leaders are readers. Leaders are readers. And I hope this week, as you've come along, you've picked up lots of hints uh, uh, for good books to read and to be reading to develop your Christian leadership. Next name is Alexander. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. Now, Paul uh, doesn't really have anything against coppersmiths. I think they're kind of useful, actually, especially if you've got a copper pot with a hole in it. Uh, No, he's he's writing to identify the particular Alexander. Then and now, it's a pretty common name. So Timothy needs to know it's Alexander the coppersmith, not Alexander the shoemaker or something like that. And evidently, Timothy will hear that and he'll go, ah, yeah, I know who you're talking about, Paul. We aren't told what great harm he did to Paul. But the warning to Timothy is clear. Beware of him. He strongly opposed the gospel message that I brought. He will continue to strongly oppose it. Be careful of his opposition. Reflect on what happened to me in the past, how he behaved, and have a plan for how to deal with him when his opposition comes. Be as innocent as a dove, Jesus says, but as shrewd as a serpent in dealing with him. For we've been reading all this week, all through Tim, to Timothy, about how careful Timothy is to be in his ministry to correctly handle the word of truth, to preach the word in season and out of season, to rightly handle this word, to observe the intricate architecture of the gospel and theology, to refute false teaching, to correct, rebuke, and encourage. And he has to do this, and we, we have to do this, in the context of many, many, many Alexanders, the coppersmiths. Now, leaders are readers, careful students not only of God's word, but also of the strong opposition there is out there to the gospel. So I'm, I hope you're making time and energy for this work. And one of the things you have to work out uh, in leadership, which uh, I want to share with you now, is 
a biblical theology of betrayal and opposition. A biblical theology of betrayal and opposition. Uh, because if you're in ministry or missionary leadership for long enough, it will definitely come. Uh, here it is in diagrammatic form. I think the diagram's on the screen. It's also in your booklet. Uh, and I want to suggest to you that this is a biblical the theology framework that you can put any topic into and you will get uh, the Bible's view of that topic. Uh, the, the arrow uh, going across is a timeline, so uh, time starts and time goes into the future. And the letters stand for these. Uh, C stands for creation. What does the Bible tell us in Genesis 1 and 2? It tells us that everything was created by God, and everything was created good. Good. So at creation, everything is good. Human relationships are good. Friendship is good. Uh, Genesis 3, what happens? F, F stands for the fall. And what happens at the fall is that sin enters the world and sin takes everything good that God had made and corrupts it. So because of the fall, everything that God originally intended for good is now tainted and compromised. So the marriage relationship between Adam and Eve is compromised. Childbearing now becomes a burden and painful and friendships are also corrupted by the fall. So you think Alexander's a friend? He's not. He betrays you. He opposes you. Demas, who used to be on your team? Well, he's not anymore. He's disappointed you. He's in love with the world. He's abandoned his posts. The fall taints everything. R stands for redemption. And uh, I said earlier this week that perhaps the first clue of the gospel in the Bible is actually in Genesis chapter 3 itself. You remember, those of you who heard it the first time, uh, that God says to the serpent, you will strike at his heel, but he will crush your head. Uh, they're speaking of the offspring of Eve. You will strike at his heel, but he will crush your head. There is the first glimpse that a descendant of Adam and Eve will be struck by the serpent, will suffer, but out of that suffering will come God's victory over sin. The rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 all the way to Jude is basically the story of redemption. How is God going to achieve a reversal of the fall that happens in Genesis 3? And the high point of redemption is, of course, when the Lord Jesus comes to pay the price for sin, to be struck on the heel by Satan, only to have his death pay the price for our sin, to completely crush Satan's head and sin and death forever by his resurrection power. That's the high point of redemption. But redemption actually still continues, doesn't it? Because Jesus ascends to heaven, and we, the church, carry out, carry on the work of redemption in publishing abroad the good news of the Lord Jesus and calling all whom God has saved for himself into his fold. And we are waiting the end of the story, which is the new creation at the end, when God will finally return, when Christ will return, and behold, he will make all things new and finally wipe away the last vestiges of sin and the fall. So please notice, we live in that period of redemptive history that is before the new creation. We know where history is going, but it's not yet. We live in the now, but the not yet. So in the now, friendships, work relationships, human sexuality, church leadership, missionary life, there are all great aspects to those things, but they are still affected and even tainted by sin. We are in, we are in the process of being redeemed by God, but internally we are still imperfect and make mistakes. And externally, the world is the same mix of nobility and betrayal and opposition and persecution. Now, uh, one re this is a... 
this reality is one reason why I'm always very keen on feedback. So please do give uh, the team here feedback on how uh, the studies have gone this whole week. Uh, Proverbs says, uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So you can tell me if all my jokes were bad. That's, that's fine. I'll just work on them for next time. Paul continues then. Paul continues, verse 16. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, as he winds up this letter, he reminds Timothy again, my ministry has been lonely and difficult. All deserted me uh, is probably a bit of an exaggeration, but it's probably exactly how he felt. Uh, probably all who were with him at the time in Rome uh, deserted him, and he felt it very deeply. But please notice, Timothy didn't desert him. Titus didn't desert him. Crescens didn't desert him. Tychicus, Luke, Mark, Barnabas, none of them deserted him. They, were, they, they just weren't there in Rome with him. Or we read uh, verse 19. Uh, this long list of people from verse 19 certainly are still on his team and haven't deserted him. Prissa and Aquila, Onesiphorus, Erastus, Trophimus, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Snoopy, Claudia, and the brothers and sisters. See, there's a great gospel team in place, isn't there? At the end of this letter, so many lovers of Christ instead of lovers of the world. There's a great missionary team in place, faithful to love uh, God and to love His Word and to love His world enough to bring that message of the gospel, uh, forgiveness from God, eternal life with God to that world. Well, as we close tonight, are you on a mission team? And what does your mission team look like? Uh, at, as we close, I want to share with you the way uh, the Church Missionary Society of CMS thinks about mission teams, and it's encapsulated in these four words that will come up on screen, uh, which lots of other mission agencies have stolen, I mean adopted with <laughs> due recognition. Uh, pray, care, give, go. As, as far as I can work out, uh, they started with us. Pray means we're on a mission team and we commit to praying for the work of missions, your global mission partners, all 29 of them. And we want to pray fervently and regularly. But you know what? At CMS, our missionaries contract with us to send regular prayer points every month back to uh, their home supporters. And part of my job is to hassle my missionaries when they don't send prayer points. Um, we, we publish lists of prayer points. We put them on apps and stuff like that. And every now and then, right at the end, it says, pray also for Sam or something like that. And, and people in CMS know that's the prayer point of shame. When it says pray also for Weihan, it means Weihan didn't bother to send any prayer points this month. <laughs> it's the prayer point of shame. Uh, don't do it. You know, pray means we're praying for them, but means as a missionary one day, you're going to be faithful in sending prayer fodder. And my missionaries, they actually want to hear your, our prayer points here in Melbourne and in Victoria as well, because they know that the work of gospel ministry is happening right here in this city, and they want to be praying for us as much as we're praying for them. Uh, care. Uh, we invest heavily in caring for our missionaries because we know what a tough context uh, they go through, what they have to put their families through in terms of transition and cross-cultural living. Uh, once a year, face-to-face, -face, uh, we visit every CMS missionary, all 200 of them all around the world. It comes at great expense to do that, but it's worth it because it's a powerful expression of our pastoral care for our workers. But you know what? Care is also a mutual thing. Our missionaries care for us. They care for the spiritual condition of their partner churches. They care about the pastoral issues as well as the mission 
and evangelism issues facing their local churches here in Melbourne. And for missionary workers who live in a part of the world where evangelism is easy, so to speak, because people do come to Christ and come in number and come regularly, uh, they care very deeply that that can sometimes be discouraging for churches uh, in a context where evangelism is difficult. Mutual care means we share these stories and we understand each other's pains uh, in ministry. Uh, give uh, refers to uh, the money and the practical support that we set aside and we send so that missionaries can be set aside and sent for service. I used to be in the old paradigm um, Missions agencies used to say, well, we're on about mission. We've got great missionaries, so you pray for them and you pay for them and they'll get on with the work of mission on your behalf. Now, that's an old paradigm. The new paradigm is to, we're in this together and there's an element of mutual giving. Uh, we give of the resources and the riches that we have so that they can be set apart to do that mission which God has called them to do. And they in, turn, they, in turn, give us the opportunity to partner with them. They give us the opportunity to relate with them and through them with their target people, groups, and locations. And there's a mutuality in giving uh, of opportunities and practical things so that together we see how we're serving on the same global mission team. Uh, and going, of course, is also mutual. They might go somewhere else to a different country, but we are also called to go, to step outside the church, to step into our workplaces and places of study with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So mutual praying, mutual caring, mutual giving, mutual going. It's a picture, isn't it, of the kind of teamwork that exists between Paul and Timothy and every member of their missionary team of these inscripturated names that we see at the end of 2 Timothy. These mission team members have their names in the eternal word of God. These are the names that you'll, you'll recognize if you love Jesus and you get to heaven. You'll, you'll meet them one day and you'll say, I know you, you're Pudens and Linus and Snoopy and whoever, and I read about you in 2 Timothy. Tell me your story. See, what a privilege to be part of God's global mission team. As we close, I want to encourage uh, each of us to spend a moment in prayer before making our written response to God uh, on this response card. I'll lead us in prayer in a while, but if you could each pull out the card, you'll see, as I mentioned before, that there are some avenues uh, for further exploration and training uh, that you can tick. You might want to join a mission nurture group uh, and find out how do I find out what's God's will for my life. Uh, or you might like more information on the perspective course. The convention booklet has more information on both those things. It might be that you're here tonight and you'd like to find out more about this Jesus and this good news and this work of mission that uh, I've been talking about, that we've been singing about it's all, frankly, just a little bit befuddling to you. You thought this was a church service and there ought to be candles and the man in front ought to be wearing a dress. Uh, sorry, wrong kind of church. Uh, but if that's you and you've, you, you've, you've not really heard this stuff about Jesus before, I want to encourage you to please tick that box and actually, better yet, come, come to the front and talk to someone uh, about Jesus tonight. Uh, that... that there's no more important conversation than you, that, that you, than you can ever have in your life than that one about Jesus. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then I'm going to encourage everyone to fill in the card and drop it in the box at the end as we leave. So uh, please would you join me in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you to, for your word to us uh, from 2 Timothy. We thank you for the great constellation of witnesses whose names are in Holy Scripture. We thank you for what we can learn about your global mission team and the part that we can play in it. Father, as uh, many of us have been here 
all through the week uh, and heard what your word says about gospel ministry and missionary work and our part in it. Uh, Lord, we want to pray that you would speak to us tonight. Amen.